what is good, what is evil, uh, and that humanity is capable of its own self-fulfillment without belief in God. That's the definition we want to use uh, tonight. Now, I'm going to give you a definition of humanism. Um, Siri, give me the definition of humanism. Checking on that. Okay. Okay. All right. Humanism. These are, these are the most um, direct definitions that I have found. Humanism is the doctrine that people's duty is to promote human welfare. Um, it is the doctrine emphasizing a person's capacity for self-realization, the doctrine emphasizing a person's capacity for self-realization through reason. It rejects religion and the supernatural. And so, based on these definitions, humanism or reasoning um, is man's, man believing in himself that he is the answer to his own problems, that he does not need a divine God. And I want you to realize that some of the traits or the spirit of secular humanism is in a lot of our churches. Because if we talk about humanism, it is basically the de-emphasis of God and the emphasis of man. And when you look at some of these doctrines or some of these preacher, uh, preachers, that come up with these uh, slogans and sayings. Uh, for example, word of faith. When they talk about word of faith, because I have the word of faith doctrine downstairs in my office, and perhaps as we're dealing with the subject, I will bring it out to you and let you read and read the doctrine of the word of faith churches to you. The word of faith churches, they're not saying the word of faith in this. They're talking about the word of faith in their words. That if God can call those things that be not as though they were, then you can call those things that be not as though they were. That if God can perform miracles, then you can perform miracles because you're a child of God. And even some preachers, I've heard them uh, even say that uh, all of us are little bitty Jesus Christ. So all of us are gods in and of ourselves. And so when they talk about the word of faith, they're talking about you having faith in your faith, having faith in what you say as to what you can produce, that you can speak things into existence, that you can speak words and change the atmosphere, that you can uh, speak healing, that you can speak into someone else's life, and your words can have a divine impact in someone else's life. That is the spirit of humanism. It is the de-emphasis of God and the emphasis on self. Now, there is what is called the New Age Movement. And it came, came around years ago. I believe it's in full swing now. Uh, and I even heard Bishop Golder talk about it. Uh, the New Age Movement is a religion that says that there is no divine God at all that all of us have a divinity inside of us. 
and that the reason why we have the problems that we have in the world is because we have not discovered the divinity in ourselves and that the only sin that there is is the ignorance of self and that the New Age movement teaches that we need to emphasize ourselves. We need to focus on ourselves in the sense that uh, discovering our own divinity within ourselves and once we discover the divinity within ourselves, then we will lose the idea of any kind of a personal God because there is no personal God. You are God. The emphasis is you. You have the power to do this. You have the power to do that. That's the New Age movement. You need to get with yourself. You need to find out about yourself. You need to discover yourself. And as soon as you discover the divinity that is in you because you are God and of yourself, then you will lose the idea of any kind of a personal God. Well, that's what's going on today. It's the de-emphasis of God and the emphasis of self. And this spirit was born in the Garden of Eden when Satan got into the serpent and dealt with Eve's uh, mind and deceived her to such an extent that she embraced what the enemy brought her. She reasoned within herself as to why it was good for her to be disobedient to God. And that's what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with all kinds of secular humanistic teachings that are creeping into the church that is more emphasizing of self than emphasizing God. You name it and claim it. It's your season. It's your time. God has this for you. Blessings for you. You sow a seed and this is going to happen. That's going to happen. And the emphasis is on self. This is why many preachers, when they go out and preach, Many preachers talk about themselves. They talk about their achievements. They talk about their accomplishments. They talk about what they have done. There's no preaching about what Jesus has done and what Jesus can do. The emphasis is on self. The emphasis is on glorifying self. The very thing that God told us to put down. If any man will be my disciple, let him first do what? Deny himself the spirit of secular humanism and the spirit of, of the reason of man is to build yourself up. To do for self. To glorify yourself. If you are confident in yourself, you can do whatever you want to do if you just believe in, not God, but believe in what? Yourself. Can we say amen? Now, this is what we want to teach on tonight. So we're going to have to touch on it a little bit. And on Friday, we will get into the meaty part of it. But first of all, let's go to the book of Proverbs as our opening scripture. Proverbs. Praise the Lord, Proverbs chapter number three, I believe it is. Proverbs chapter three. And let's read verse number one. We're going to deal with verse one down to verse seven. Humanism versus faith in God, or secular humanism, or reasoning, or the reasoning of man, the thinking of man. This is what we're going to deal with. Identify this demon that's out there and how we are supposed to deal with it. Can we say amen? Because it's in fact a demon. It is a demon now. It is a demon. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 1, let's read. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart 
keep my commandments. Now, Solomon had how many wives? 700 wives and what? 300 concubines. How many women is that? A thousand women. And of course, they use their concubines like they use their wives. Now, if he has seven, a thousand women, how many children do you think he had? Well, um, there was two kings and one judge in your Bible that had 70 sons. And of course, you know that was not by one woman uh, by any means. History says that Adam and Eve had a total of 60 children, according to history. 33 sons and 27 daughters. Now, of course, we are all the children of Adam and Eve. Is that right? But, well, you might not be able to answer that. Maybe you can answer this question. Out of all the sons that Solomon had, which one do you think he's talking to here when he says, my son? He's not talking to any one of them. This is to the sons of God. This is to the church. Can we say amen? So, he says, my son, forget not my what? Law. Don't forget his law. Now, many people like to say, well, you are legalistic. And they only say that because they don't want to put the flesh down. That's what it is. They don't want to deny themselves. That's why they talk about uh, us being legalistic. Uh, Deacon Harris told me, very funny story, if I can use this, how he went and visited his uh, family down in Indiana, and he went to... Um, the church picnic down there and he talked to the pastor and the pastor asked him what, what church he went to what religion was he says apostolic he said oh Acts 238 he said oh y'all say I ain't saved then huh now, I don't know what he responded to him with that but I thought it was pretty funny but they know people know out there they know he says my son forget not my law now there's a conjunction that connects two opposite thoughts Right after that, what is that conjunction? But, but, now he's going to show us the flip side of the coin now. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my what? Commandments. So you can't keep his commandments if you um, forget his law, because his law is the commandments. Can we say amen? Do you see that there? My son, forget not my law, semicolon, but let thine heart keep my commandments. So the law is God's what? Commandments. As a matter of fact, the law was the Ten Commandments that he gave to Moses on Mount Sinai in the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. Then 40 years later, rehearsed it in the uh, fifth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy to the children of those that came out of Egypt. So the law of God is the commandments of God. And he tells us, don't forget his law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Why? Verse 2. For a length of days and long life and peace shall they what? Add to thee. Now, uh, Brother Damon here was just down in Jackson and a young man got killed, shot in the head. Uh, I think he did die. Uh, 20 years old. Well, they had three shootings. I got a brother down there. They're killing each other down there in Jackson like it's free. Young men losing their lives. Well, if we forget not God's law and from our heart keep his commandments, in verse 2, this is what it will produce in us. For length of days and long life and peace shall they what? Add to these. So that indicates then that a person can shorten their days. Uh, one way that children can shorten their days is to be disobedient to their parents. Because you find in the scriptures, it talks about uh, children, honor your father and mother as, you know, as is fit in the Lord, that thy days may be long. And so... Um, you can shorten your days and you can lengthen your days. And of course, here in this text, by us keeping God's law, not forgetting God's law, keeping his commandments from the heart, we can lengthen our days. We can have long life and what? Peace. Shall they what? Add to thee. Now, they were only talking about uh, certain black men say they're afraid to go out and drive around because the police, I'm not afraid of the police. I get out there and drive just like I normally drive any other time. You know why? Because I keep God's, I haven't forgotten his law and I keep his commandments. Because it's going to give you what? 
peace. Can we say amen? Paul said, who can harm you if you be followers of that which is good? So we should not be afraid of the police. Shouldn't be afraid of nobody. Jesus said, fear not him that can destroy the body, but fear him that can not only destroy the body, but can cast the soul where? In the hell. Can we say amen? See, the devil wants folks scared to death, and he's accomplishing that. People are terrified out there. You know, the government is paranoid, uh, and uh, of course the devil is, is, is uh, he's the god of this world. He's doing what he does. He ain't doing anything different. He's always done this. Can we say amen? He's always been a killer and a murderer. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. You know, so we should not be joining Black Lives Matter. We should be saying Jesus' life matters. Is that right? And leave all this other stuff alone. I bet not see no member in this church talking about I'm joining Black Lives Matter. <laughs> you better join, you better join the, the, the team Salvation Matters. You know, uh, and, and, and of course all lives matter. Is that right? God says all souls are mine. Every soul is precious. You know, but anyway, we just thought we'd throw that political thing out there for you. Uh, show you how, where we should stand. So he says, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Verse 3. Let not mercy and truth, what? That indicates that mercy and truth can run out. It can run out. Now, God's mercy is God not rewarding us what we actually deserve. But that can run out. Now, how long will it be before it runs out? I don't know. Only God knows. But the proverb writer here, Solomon says, don't let it forsake you. Now, what is two ways you can prevent mercy uh, and truth forsaking you? It's right here in the Bible. You already read it. What is it? Don't forget his law and what? Keep his commandments from the heart. Can we say amen? From the heart. And if you do that, then mercy and truth will not turn their back on you. When you look for it, it'll be there. But if I am not mindful of God's law and I'm not keeping his commandments from my heart, then I am sowing and I'm going to reap that mercy is going to, and truth is going to turn his back on me because I turned it my back on it. Because you can only reap what you sow. Is that right? Well, he says, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the what? Table of thine heart. Why? So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God. And what? And that's what we want. Is that right? Now, this is the verse what we want. Verse number five. Let's read. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. And what else? In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and what? Now, let's take that in reverse order. Verse 6. Um, depart from evil. What causes a person to have a mindset to depart from evil is because that they fear the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. And the reason why men are involved in evil today is because they simply don't fear who? They don't fear God. They don't fear God. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. And when it talks about fear in the Lord, it's not talking about that you're just so terrified of God. It just, it's a reverential fear that you are so you reverence God so and you hold him in such high esteem and respect that you will not allow yourself to go off into evil. It's kind of like um, when we were growing up, there were things we dared not do in front of our parents. Is that right? Nowadays, kids smoke in front of their parents, drink in front of their parents. Uh, the parents get high right, right, right with the kids, you know. But at some point in our lives, there was some sort of a reverence that we had for our parents. We just didn't act the way we could act around our parents. That's why we didn't want them around. 
Can we say amen? <laughs> Especially if you're going on a date. Mama say, I'm going with you. No, come on, mama. You can't be a no, Mama, you're going to cramp my scalp now. Nah, mama, mama, come on now. And don't let mama kiss you on the cheek uh, when the girlfriend's around. Well, you know, it, 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 sometimes it can have the effect that, oh, he's, he's so sweet. Look at him, let his mama kiss him. But sometimes men think that that is an invasion of their masculinity. Makes them seem that they're weak or something. I ain't kiss nobody. No, no, no. <laughs> well, we're just in a new day today. But you get the point what we're saying. Is that right? You know, we just didn't do certain things. Well, look at that in reference to God. Now, we can't see God with the naked eye, but he's everywhere at the same time. Uh, he hears everything that we say. He sees everything that we do. And if we have the fear of God that we should have, we will depart from evil and stay away from evil when no one is even around us. Can we say amen? All right. So uh, that's taking us in reverse order. Um, depart from evil because you fear the Lord. Now, the reason why we took it in reverse order is because when a person is wise in their own eyes, they don't fear God because their emphasis is on themselves. And you can't emphasize yourself without de-emphasizing God. That's secular humanism, what we're talking about tonight. That's the reasoning of man. That's the thinking of man. The de-emphasis of God and the emphasis of self. And you see it even in the church with some of the doctrines that they teach and some of the cliches that they have. Don't you think that the devil is not trying to infiltrate the teachings that are going on in the church? Remember, Jesus said, I think it was to the church of Sardis, he said, I know where Satan's seat is. You know where it was at? Right in the church. Now, that was thousands of years ago. Or should I say almost a thousand years ago? Yeah, yeah, maybe thousands of years ago. So where is he at now in the church? Can we say amen? <laughs> you know, so um, the de-emphasis of God, emphasis of self. And this is why you see preachers, a lot of preachers, they preach about themselves. There was one bishop that was supposed to be preaching a uh, ordination service where you're supposed to give the charge to the candidates that are being ordained. As Paul said to Timothy, I charge you to preach the word. All he did was talk about himself. And that's what some of these people do. That is part of that spirit of the New Age movement. The de-emphasis of God, talking about yourself, building up yourself, discovering the divinity of yourself, and then you will lose the idea that there is no personal, of, of any personal God, because you are the answer to your own problems. You can just speak it into existence. Can we say amen Now, what they say? Nobody can call those things that be not as though they were but God. He's the only one. Changing, speaking words that you change the atmosphere. You know, speaking things into somebody's life. You can't speak nothing in nobody's life. God can. Now, you can encourage somebody, is that right? But you can't dictate how a person's life outcome is going to be by what you say. Even God does not do that. He gives us free will. Does that make sense? See, see, see this, 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 this demon is, is creeping into church. And the reason why I say it's a demon is because it's a persuasion. It's a mode of thinking. It's a spirit. That's what it is. It's a spirit. All right? Um, so, in um, verse number five, uh, he says, Trust in the Lord with what? All thine heart, that is with all your mind, with all your reasoning, with all your logic, with all your thinking, with everything that is within you. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. What's the next clause? And lean not unto thine own what? Understanding. All right, understanding. We cannot walk with God and lean on our own reasoning. And when we talk about reasoning, we're talking about 
man fathoming out or figuring out or coming to his own conclusions as to what is right and what is wrong, coming to his own conclusions as to how he is to live outside and apart from God. It is man dictating what makes sense to him to do and to act and to behave. It's his reasoning as to what is right and what is wrong. Man's reasoning is to look at things and come to his own conclusions outside of any kind of influence of the word of God at all. That's why a numbers of times Jesus rebuked the apostles, the disciples, and he would say, O oh, ye of little faith, why reason ye in your hearts? They were trusting, leaning to their own what? Understanding. You see, that's what the world does. But now that we come into the church, the word of God is what we're supposed to put our trust in. We, de we look at the word of God to define to us what is right and what is wrong. We look to the word of God to give us what the conclusions of any and every situation should be. We look to the word of God to dictate how we are to behave, how we are to be, how we are to treat one another, what is right, what is wrong how we are to think, how we are to worship, how we are to believe. You know, there are people out there that will teach you what and how you are supposed to believe in God based on their reasoning and their interpretation. That's why the Lord said in Luke 4 and 4 and Matthew 4 and 4, quoting from Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth what? Out of the mouth of God. Doth man live? Because if man tries to live based upon his own reasoning, he's going to destroy himself. How do we know that? The Garden of Eden is a demonstration of that. Can we say amen? In Eve, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life was demonstrated in her disobeying God. You know why? Because the devil came and emphasized her to her and de-emphasized God. And that's, and, and, and that's why Facebook and Twitter, and you got to be careful about how much you talk about yourself on there. You got to be careful because the demon can slip in there in any kind of way. And without the word of God... We will be gone off astray and not even know it. That's how deception works. That's why we got to have Bible class. Can we say amen? So that we can come to learn and to see, well, actually, when we come to Bible class, we are trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. And we're not leaning to our own understanding. We demonstrate that by just coming to the house of God. That's why the devil tries to throw everything at us to keep us from coming. He does not want us to act out our trust in God. See, trust in God is a behavior. Can we say amen? It's action. It's not only just in thought. It starts in thought. The person makes up their mind that they're going to trust God, and because they're going to trust God, it is demonstrated in their behavior. And you did that tonight by coming to church. This is a big thing that you did. Can we say amen? If you was to ask the devil, devil, what? Should I go to church tonight? He'll give you all kinds of reasons why you should not come. It's going to be hot in there. The pastor, you got a headache, and he's going to be talking real loud. Aren't you tired? Am I? Yeah, you tired? Yeah, I am tired. We talk to ourselves all the time. Yeah, I am. 
I am a little tired. Why don't you just go and lay down? You, 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 may, you, you there every Tuesday. Well, don't you need a break? The flesh is saying, give me a break. <laughs> give me some time now. That's what he's saying. He tells you, don't, isn't this what you want? When the flesh is, it's actually what he wants. Can we say amen? <laughs> See, he tells you, don't you want, because he knows that your soul is saved. See, the flesh ain't saved. Flesh ain't going to hell. The flesh will not suffer any kind of fire down the lake of fire. It knows that. That's all the more reason why we shouldn't give in to it. Why am I going to let that which is not going to suffer get me in trouble for me to suffer? <laughs> you know, I'm a fool then. Can we say, man, anybody would be a fool. If somebody tell you, jump off that bridge. Jump off uh, Vent's bridge. What you going to look at them and say, you jump off the bridge. No, it's going to hurt me, but I want to see you do it. Well, that's how the flesh works. All the time, it talks to you. You know, you got a headache. Maybe you had a rough day on the job, dealing with all kinds of things. Got a little stressed out, got a headache. Then the flesh tells you, you got a headache. Now you ought to say, I know I got a headache. I'm the one hurt. But that's how the flesh works. Need you to just say, I'm going to deny myself. Can we say amen? So you deserve a lot of credit for coming to the house of God. You get credit from God every time you come. Because every time you come, you are demonstrating your trust in the Lord. And you're not leaning to your own what? Understanding. Your own reasoning as to why you shouldn't go. Does that make sense? Well, they, uh, they had the Republican... Um, convention going on this week and a big controversy that uh, Donald Trump's wife supposedly had plagiarized her speech. Did y'all see that? That she supposedly copied Michelle Obama's uh, speech. Uh, maybe Donald is more democratic than we really realize, huh? You know, and so, and people are, you know, but you should hear all of the reasonings as to why it was okay, as to why they, as, and, that, and that's what they do. I saw uh, Don Lemon on CNN, and he had the sheriff of Minnesota, and he couldn't hardly get through the interview with, because the sheriff was acting up. All he wanted to do is condemn Black Lives Matter and say that the police is the black man's best friend. I thought a dog was man's best friend. That's what they said. But anyway, uh, he was on there uh, defending the police and, and Black Lives Matter is this and that and all this other kind of stuff and why these police shootings are going on and all that. I know why the police shootings are going on because the police are killing other people. Some of those murders are not justifiable. Murder is murder. And if we want to get down to the Bible, no death is justifiable in the sight of God. I mean, if we're going to get down to the Bible, can we say amen? They're all wrong when it comes to the Bible. Because the one that had never sinned, never done anything wrong, was killed. What was his name? Jesus. That was the only unjustified murder that God turned around and used it for our justification. Isn't that something? You know, he's the real martyr. He's the martyr of martyrs. But the world is so hypocritical. They like to point fingers, and, and, uh, but, but that's the world. That's what they do. They do what they do. Is that right? So, but we in the church, we are not supposed to be getting involved in all that. You know, online talking about, you know, all this other kind of stuff because that's man's reasoning. We're supposed to trust in who? The Lord. Can we say amen? Shouldn't be carrying no guns. We're supposed to be trusting who? In the Lord with all our heart and leaning not to our own 357. Because you got some preachers out there that are carrying guns. Yeah, I keep saying it over and I'm going to keep on saying it. 
because it's right. Got some preachers carrying, even in this state, got some preachers carrying guns. That's not trusting in the Lord. That's leaning to your own what? Understand? Because what if somebody comes in? What if this happens? What does this happen? I can hear Jesus say, why reason ye among yourselves? O ye of what? Little faith. Jesus knew they were coming to kill him. He didn't do nothing. He didn't fight back, and he knew they were coming to kill him. What are we supposed to do? The Bible says we're supposed to love our brothers to the extent that if it was necessary to lay down our lives for our brethren. But no, we don't want to do that. We will shoot somebody for our brother. That's not trusted in the Lord. That's leaning to your own what? That's why I guess nobody bothers me when I says this online. And people all know because they know it's right. Well, anyway, um, so in Proverbs chapter 3, uh, lean not to thine own understanding. So as we deal with reasoning, humanism, secular humanism, emphasizing self, Jesus told us we need to destroy self. The world is talking about, no, you build self up and get rid of God. <laughs> That's what the world is saying. And you can see some of the tenets of the spirit even in churches where they emphasize self. They preach self and don't preach very much Jesus. Well, let's go to Genesis, see where it all began. All right, Genesis. And we're going to read... Uh, let me see here. Praise the Lord. Genesis chapter number three. Is that what we want? Now God told Adam and Eve, out of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said do not eat of it. Is that right? Now I don't want you to think that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a tree that was to educate man what evil was and what knowledge was. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was a tree that God did not want the man and his wife to partake of because he did not want them to have the knowledge of evil in their nature. He did not want them to come to know evil. He tried to keep them from the condition of knowing sin through experience. And his inability to uh, practice what is good. He did not want them to experience evil. He did not want them to suffer the inability to do good. Because now that man has experienced sin, it is summed up in the narrative of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter number 7. He said, the, wood, the good that I do, I don't do that. But the evil that I don't want to do. That's the knowledge of good and evil in the 7th chapter of Romans. When I would do good, evil is what? Always present. You know why? Because man had now come into an awareness within his nature of sin. And his inability to cease from sin and his inability to do good as God dictates good is. Now, when Adam and Eve were created, I was reading one uh, apostolic preacher's writings one time. He said, Adam and Eve um, were not created to live forever. And that if the fact that God had the tree of life in the garden shows that Adam and Eve did not have eternal life, that's why God had the tree there and that they could have ate of that tree and lived forever. That's some false doctrine. Because what you have to understand, 
there was no death. There was no death at all. And since there was no death, because there was no sin in the world, the Bible says death is by sin. So when God created Adam and Eve, they had eternal life already. But when they sinned, God kicked them out of the garden because he said unless they partake of the tree of life and live forever, God did not want man to live forever in sin. So that's why he kicked them out of the garden. But they already had eternal life because there was, there was no death. Death came when what came into the world? Sin. Fifth chapter of Romans said death by sin. And so all men die because of sin. But there was no sin in the world at the time. So he is misguided in that. So Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1, let's read. Now the serpent was more what? Subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now keep in mind now, this is in the sixth day. This is around almost 6,000 years ago from our, from our day. And you had the Adam, you had Adam, and you have Eve. There are some that teach that when Adam named his wife Eve, because Eve means she's the mother of all living, and they say, well, that means then that Adam and Eve had children before they sinned, because if Adam called his wife's name Eve and she was the mother of all living, that means then that she had to have some living before. Well, if that's the case, where are those people then? Because if Adam and Eve had already gave birth to children, there, before they sinned, there was no sinful nature. And so if they did not have sin in their nature, that means that they were born uh, with eternal life. And so where are they today? He called her Eve because she was the mother of all living because that's what Moses said she did. Because Moses wrote the book of what? Genesis. You see how people can get so misguided with the Bible? Well, so you have the woman here and the serpent. The devil is in the serpent. That's why in what, Revelation chapter 12, he's called that old serpent, the devil. The devil had got inside the serpent and is now communicating with Eve. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now in this scenario, in this story, we're going to see the beginning of reasoning. We're going to see Satan bring to her secular humanism in his infant stages because he focuses on what she can be, focuses on her rather than focusing on God. Can we say amen? You see that? All right, let's read. And he said unto the woman, yeah, yeah, hath God said, you shall not what? Yeah, God said you can't eat of any of these trees. In other words, God is keeping some things from you. You see, that's how the enemy works. See, when he comes to us, he comes to us a lot of times in a sense that we're being deprived of something. God is depriving us of something. And there's no truth to it whatsoever. Because we already know that the Lord said they can eat of every tree except for one. We see how the devil turns around? Yeah, God said you can't eat any of these trees. You see how he messed with what God's words, what, what God said, and that's what people are doing today. They're taking the Bible and saying whatever they wanted to say. All right? Yea, hath God said you should not eat of every tree of the garden. Yeah, God said you can't eat of all these trees. God said you can't eat of any of these trees of the garden. Let's read verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. What? Now she's fine now because you know what she gave back to the serpent? What did she give back to him? The word of God. And as the devil kept on messing with her, she should have kept on giving him the what? Word of God. That's what Jesus did when he dealt with Satan in uh, in the wilderness when he was fasting he gave him the what? So if that's what Jesus did then what are we supposed to do when we're tempted? We're supposed to deal with give them what? Word of God. Can we say amen? 
But most folk, that when the devil's talking to them, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the one is being drifted away. The word is over here, and they're being drifted away from the word. You can't listen to the devil. If you're going to listen to him, you need to give him the word. Can we say amen? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, because all of us face the devil every day in different manners and different forms. All of us have. Sometimes you just, when you get a chance, uh, before you go to sleep tonight, just lay back and just meditate for a few minutes after you say your prayers. You know, you say your prayer, then get into bed, just meditate for a few minutes and think about uh, how many times a day the devil came to you. You'd be surprised what you will see and what you dealt with today. Just the day alone. All right, well, uh, we can eat of the fruit of the tree's garden. We can't eat of one. All right, verse number three. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not what? Surely die. Ye shall not surely die. So now he's lying to her. He's tricking her now. Because she is doing what? She's listening. You cannot listen to the devil. You cannot listen to the devil. How do I know it's the devil? When he tells you something that's contrary to what you know that is true. Because God's not going to allow you to be tempted above that you're able. So when the enemy comes to tempt you, it's something you already know what's right. Because God's not going to allow the enemy to come and blindside you with something that you have no knowledge about as far as what to do. Now, sometimes we act like we don't know what to do. <laughs> we say, amen. Pastor, I went to the store and uh, bought something. They gave me $20 change back, $20 more than what I was supposed to get. What do I do? You know what to do. <laughs> you say, amen. You know what to do. You know, now, of course, if you go to McDonald's and you order three cookies and you, you find out that they gave you an extra one, then you can't take the cookie back, you know. Uh, well, you can take it back, but they're not going to take it from you. They have to throw it away, you know. Uh, but we know what to do because any temptation that comes to us, he will not tempt us above that which we are what? Able. Now, we just generally think of that as our ability not to be able to endure it. But being tempted above that which you're able also includes that your knowledge of what you have learned in your experiences and as you've been taught by God. The devil is not going to bring something to you that is more knowledgeable than what you know, what the Bible says, as to what you are supposed to do. Does that make sense? Who say amen? That's, you know, we, we have to consider that also. God is faithful in that also. So not only does he give me the ability to endure it, he also gives me the ability to know what to do when the enemy brings a proposition to me, challenges what I know, what I've been taught, what I believe, to see if I really believe it to the extent that I will suffer in obeying it, suffer in doing what God said do rather than just taking the easy way out. That's going to burn me later on. Because when I get down to pray later on, the Holy Ghost is going to bring it back to me. Can we say amen? All right. Does that make sense? All right. So um, in verse number, he says, you shall not surely die. Verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing what? But see, what he did not tell her, what, he, what it really happened, was that her eyes was going to be open to sin being in her nature and that she would be cut off from God because of her disobedience. You see, uh, I watched a movie years ago as a young saint. Uh, this demon mute movie. It was called The Wishmaster. Y'all ever seen that? 
<laughs> oh, crazy movie. This guy, he's from somewhere. He gives, appears, gives people three wishes. He says, make your wishes. And whatever wish that they give him, it's not what they think that it is. And it is a, uh, because what he does is that he is taking their soul in him giving him their wish. And all kind of, it was a crazy movie. I shouldn't have been watching that movie. I was young, young so I shouldn't have had no business watching that mess. But it, it's, to some degree, it's true. Because, see, Satan didn't tell her the truth about what would happen. Satan don't tell the truth. He might tell you an element of truth. For, but he always has an ulterior motive. You know, he doesn't lie all the time. Sometimes he tells you the truth to set you up for a lie later on based upon the truth that he told you earlier. He don't tell you the truth to get you to walk in the ways of God. But he will, the devil will come and tell you the truth to set you up with a lie later on. And because he told you the truth earlier and he gives you the lie later on, you can't decipher which is which because you've been listening to him all along. Can we say amen? And then it just, you know, it uh, puts you at odds with God. You know. Um, so he told you, you're not going to die. In other words, if you eat that fruit of the tree, you're not going to fall down dead immediately. You know? Yeah, she was going to die if she ate, but, you know, you're not going to die right now. Because, see, when God told Adam, uh, for in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. In Hebrew, the phrase is, in eating... And in dying, thou shalt die. If you eat as in eating, dying, thou shalt die. But he didn't tell her that. See. Well, let's read on. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. See, so the devil tricked her. All right, now. Let's look at the um, verse number six. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that's the lust of the eyes now, and that it was pleasant to what? The eyes, the lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one, why? That's the pride of life. It's going to set her apart now. It's going to make her wise. It's going to set her apart from everybody else. It's going to make her wise. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, tree was good for food, that's the lust of the flesh. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. That's the pride of life. What happened? She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her. And what? Now, it happened because of her reasoning. See, the enemy is focusing on her. He's talking to her. God said you can't eat of none of these trees. Number one, God is keeping things from you. You cannot eat of any of these trees. The woman gives him the word of God. He says, number two, you are not going to die, focusing on you again. But God don't know that in the day that you eat, you, ye eat, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as what? God's knowing what? Place the emphasis and she started listening. She started listening. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, she, now she's deceived. She's looking at something that is going to kill her. But because of her reasoning, she came to her own conclusions as to whether or not she should obey God or do what she wants to do. See, this is humanism in its infant stages through the reasoning of man. See, she was supposed to have her faith in what God said. God said for me not to eat. I'm going to die. The tree is not good. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart and not lean to my what? 
people do it all the time. People do it all the time. When it comes in our everyday saved life, because when we are outside of the church, we are dealing with all kinds of spirits, all kinds of forces, all kinds of things that challenge us. And, so many, and, and, and a lot of times we're dealing with so much things that God is like just completely out of our minds because we are so bombarded with a whole bunch of things that we're dealing with. And in a lot of cases, we are uh, vulnerable. That's why we need to be prayerful throughout the day so that we won't be so vulnerable. Can we say amen? Now, God helps us. He helps us even when we're vulnerable. Uh, because when we are dealing with the things that we're dealing with every day and we are focused and we are passionate trying to do our jobs and take care of our family and focus on here and there, then the enemy comes in like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord lifts up a what? Standard against them. What is that? That's the Word of God that arises up in our hearts. It gives us a defense. Because we were vulnerable, because God was not really in our mind, because we're so distracted and preoccupied, and then the enemy comes in, and then there's the standard that lifts up. Can we say amen? And we're like, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute now. <laughs> and we're able to get our spiritual defenses up. Does that make sense? All right, so... Um, Let's read what happens. Verse number seven. We all know what happened. Let's read. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were what? Naked. Now they are cut off from God. For the first time, they are cut off from God. All right? Now, the Bible says that Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. But he made a decision. Um... Either I'm going to be with my wife. Now, if he had not eaten of the fruit of the tree, his wife would have died and God would have got, got him another wife. Uh, but he wanted that one. So he made a decision. He reasoned in, of his, in himself. The Bible says the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. He didn't want to make the decision to choose. He didn't want to do it, but he did it anyway. And... That's what doomed the human family. Because as he reasoned in his mind what he should do, he chose his wife over God. And this is where it started. And it's been perpetuated, it's been perpetual even unto this day, where men in and out of the church have their reasons why they are not doing what they know. God says do. Isn't that something? Know what God says do. I know the Bible said that we're not, but you see uh, the way that I see it. That's the emphasis of self, isn't it? Because if you're going to emphasize God, well, I can't do that. Why? Because God, well, what about you? I'm doing what God said do. Jesus is the center. You know, people like to sing that song, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Is he really the center of the church's joy? How about him being the center of our obedience? Can we say amen? If you want Jesus to be the center of your joy, that's fine. How about him being the center of our obedience? That's what he wants. And uh, he's getting that. He's getting that through us. Is that right? And through others that are walking with God. All right, well, uh, the eyes became open to sin. And they knew that they were naked, and they sold what? Fig leaves together and made themselves what? Here is an example of man trying to cover up his failure in God, trying to make atonement for himself. Um, their attempt to cover themselves or their sin and, of course, we find out that God rejects it. Um, so, um, let's read the next verse. 
Um, verse number 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst what? So that's what sin did for them. Caused them to hide. They hid from God. You know, one thing about sin, sin, uh, the flesh likes to hide sin. That's why the Bible says, he that cover their sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have what? Mercy. See, the flesh wants to hide, cover up sin. And we cannot allow that to happen because sin will eat us up from the inside out. Sin will drag us to the gutter where he is if we allow it to. See, the devil can't make us do nothing. Now that we have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the devil can't make us do nothing. He can't make you do nothing. That's why he comes to try to get us to do it because he can't make us do anything because greater is he that is in us than he that is where? In the world. So he can't make us do nothing. So he comes to try to trick us into doing some things. He gets us to focus on ourselves and make us feel we have the right to do or that it's okay to do and all these type of things. That's what he does. But if we could ever hold the truth and get close to God, Satan will never, ever be able to get anywhere with us. Ever. And he knows that. <laughs> Can we say amen? All right. Well, we're almost finished for tonight. Um, let's read on here. He heard the voice of God in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him. Now did God know where Adam was? But the reason why God was calling out to Adam is to give him an opportunity to reach out to God so that God can save him. That's what God was saying. So even in Adam being disobedient, God was still reaching out to him to try to help him. Isn't that something? That's the mercy of God. David said, Lord, how long are you going to let the wicked prosper? How long are you going to let my enemies, you know, um, they shoot at me with the dark. They mock me while they say, where is your God? Because sometimes we can get a little impatient, can't we? Lord, when is the building going to just fall on and crack them upside the head? But God is a what? Merciful God. So even in dealing with Adam, God is giving him an opportunity to reach out to him so he can save him. That's why he's calling him, because he already knew what happened. Verse 10, and he said... I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I what? Now, he didn't say because I ate of the fruit of the tree. But in him describing his reason as to why he was not where God would have him to be, let us know that he had eaten of the fruit of the tree. You see, when a person is in sin, the sin is manifested in their character and the behavior. That's, how, that's why the pastor is able many times to know who's in sin in the congregation. Because sin has an aura about it. Sin has a flavor about it many times. And sometimes God will give the pastor the insight to see. Not all the time, but many times. And it has happened to me many times. And so look at what Adam, look at his reason as to why he was not where God, where he was normally meeting God. He had a meeting place with God. And God came looking for him, and he was not there. And so he calls out to him, and he says, where are you? And Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I what? 
for the first time, he was not where he normally was. A condition was created in him that caused him to have a reason as to why he was not where God would have him to be. And many times, I, that, that, that happens a lot of times. You know. And many times, I, I've, I've talked to people over the years uh, in this church and, and in the former churches I was at that um, I would talk to different saints. And by what they're saying, I could tell they done done something. Then done something. Just like this. Do you see what we're saying here in verse 10? You know. Um, verse number 11. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Now, what's the next question? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now, many... Bible students will say that Adam here is making an excuse. He's blaming the woman. He's not blaming the woman. He's just telling God what happened. I don't know why preachers do that. Well, let's read verse 12. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did what? And so a lot of preachers say, you see, he's blaming the woman. Adam refusing to take responsibility for himself. He's blaming the woman. Well, then why did God make him coats of skin to cover his sin then if he wasn't repentant. He was repentant. Somebody says, well, how come he just didn't say yeah? Because you don't confess by just saying yeah. Can we say amen? You give a full, when God talks to you and asks you for an explanation, you give him what he wants. If you are repentant, you will. I made a little mistake the other day, Pastor. I want you to forgive. I want you to pray to God. Well, I made a little mistake the other day, Pastor. I want you to forgive me. Now, first of all, you ain't right now. Because you asking me to forgive you? I ain't Catholic priest, and I ain't Jesus. Can we say amen? And the Catholic priest can't forgive you either. Well, say uh, ten Hail Marys and five Our Fathers, and uh, you'll be fine. I saw that in the Grand Torino when he, Clint Eastwood went in there and confessed that he kissed uh, a girl at some dinner and the priest said, well, say five Hail Marys and ten Our Fathers and, uh, and he's about to go out and kill some folk or, or cause a murder or whatever. Well, it's a good movie. But uh, <laughs> you watch a lot of movies. I'm retired. But anyway, um, what was I saying? Lord have mercy. I shouldn't have been talking about Gran Torino, shouldn't I? <laughs> what was we saying? Oh, the honest confession. Thank you very much. See, that was a test to see if you was really, uh, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Well, as we finish. So, he wasn't blaming, he wasn't blaming the woman. He just told God what happened. Isn't this what happened? He's given an honest confession. And if he was still, if he was blaming the woman, then God couldn't have made him a coat of skin and atonement for his sin because he had confessed that he was repentant. Now, Adam was sorry for what he did. He did not know the full ramifications behind what he did. He did what he did because he wanted to be with his wife because the devil knew how to get to him. See, the devil may not know how to get to you in some things, but he'll use somebody else to try to what? Get to you. Can we say amen? He'll send somebody way across town that don't even live on your side of town. Way over there to you on your job. Just as you about to punch out for the lunch break and said, I was thinking about you. Oh, yeah, I know you was, demon. <laughs> I know you was. My brother told me that, um, I guess I could tell you this, um, that all these girls in Jackson want to know, where's Raider? We haven't seen him. I said, who is this? And he started naming them. I said, oh, them girls, oh, yeah. They, they said they wanted me to give, you, give them your phone number. I said, he's married. He's a pastor. They said, so what? I said, I'm glad you had enough sense not to give them tech. Here's my phone number. 
I don't want to be dealing with no, you know, let's, I, I told him, I told him, you saved and you married and all that. And, and, and the devil don't care about you being married. Is that right? You said, you told the devil, I got a ring on my finger. The devil said, I got five of them. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, let's finish up here. We're almost done. Um, so he made an honest confession. Verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what? What is this that thou hast done? Talk to the woman. And the woman said, what? The serpent, he tricked me. The serpent tricked me. She knew she messed up. The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Well, you know how he did it? He dealt with her reasoning as to why she should do contrary to God. Because see, as the devil was dealing with Eve's mind and talking to her, what she was doing, she did not see it as disobeying God. So that's the deception. The deception wasn't just that she just ate of the fruit. She was deceived into thinking that she was not disobeying God by eating the fruit. That's the deception. All because of her reasoning, because the devil came and gave her some attention. He saw her, took the theater light, flashed it on her. She was the spotlight, darkness all around her, and told her, it's your time now, Eve, because I'm going to destroy the human family, and I'm going to come at you. And that's exactly how he works. We got to be careful in our thoughts when people come to us. Can we say amen? With our feelings, when the past is resurrected to us, that long lost person that we ain't seen in 50 years, and now they come from out of nowhere. We have to be watchful, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. The devil is as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he what? Read the Bible, but you resist steadfast in the faith. Isn't that what he said? All right. Well, I didn't have time to study this like I wanted to, so this is just scratching the surface, so we'll get to the meat of it on... Uh, uh, Friday. I thought this was the meeting. Oh, this was the porterhouse portion of it. We have some T-bone coming. Can we say amen? New York Strip. Any questions tonight? Any questions? Yes, sir. We don't know how long that period was. The Bible doesn't tell us. But, but you do raise an interesting point that um, I was supposed to make, and I'll make it now. It was just a few moments that the devil dealt with Eve that has brought 6,000 years of destruction, of murder, disease, hate, crimes, death, starvation, just a few words, a few moments of him dealing with her. Isn't that something? That look at from that day forward to now all of the things that have happened. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, I believe that. I believe that. The devil wants to destroy anything that God is doing. Anything that God is doing. Now, now even, the devil's even turning people against the police. 13th chapter of Romans, it calls the law enforcement the uh, minister of God. Uh, 
And so we believe in the police force, but look at the rebellion now. I never thought I'd see the day where the police are afraid. What in the world? <laughs> the police, they got the bulletproof vests, they got the guns, they got the rifles, and they're afraid? You know the devil is doing some stuff in this world, isn't he? It's time to get up out of here, isn't it? At the I saw police on TV scared. They supposed to be the baddest of the bad. They scared. <laughs> oh, even so, what? Come, Lord Jesus. I mean, it was a, I was over at Elder Shiver's uh, mother's house a couple years ago, and a fight broke out in the street. I called the police. They didn't show up. They didn't show up a half hour later. Well, I was sitting on the porch over here when I was living in 10th Street, and a fight broke out about 10 guys at Bernie Park. I called the police. The sirens went on for five minutes before they showed up on the scene. You know what they was waiting for? <laughs> waiting for all of them to leave, then they show up. What's going on now? Yes, sir, Brother Blaine. Yep. Uh, pretty soon, you you know, it's just people are just, the devil is just terrifying. Now we not, God has not given us the spirit of what? Fear. So where are they getting their fear from? <laughs> it's part of the fallen nature because they ain't walking with God. See, when you ain't walking with God, you need to be afraid. When you're walking with Jesus, you don't need to be afraid. You know, but and when I saw that, I said, my God, the cops are scared now. What in the world? Well, let's take our offering tonight. And pray to be just uh, Somebody else had it? Uh, yes, it's Nikki. Matt. Well, the yoke was what the farmer... When the farmer wanted to break in a young oxen, they had what was called a yoke, which uh, was put around the neck of the ox. And it was, it had two holes in it so that the, um, the farmer would use the old ox train the new ox and so the old ox he would put the yoke on each of them and the ox the old ox would begin to move well the young ox uh, had to keep up with the old ox if the young ox didn't keep up with the old ox then because that old ox was more powerful than the young ox if the young ox rebelled then that yoke would rub sores in the neck of that oxen that was very painful. So uh, until that young ox got the point, he needs to keep up and stop when the old ox stop and move when the old ox moves. So when he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, Jesus is the old ox. We are the young ox and he's in the yoke with us and he is trying to show us the way. And if we rebel against him or try to go our own way, we're going to rub grooves in our necks. We're going to hurt ourselves. Um, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. His call. In the church? <laughs> Not tonight. <laughs> right. No.
Right. They didn't have to be. Lust means desires. He aroused her desire to eat the tree. Lust is desires. See, she still had a human nature. It just wasn't fallen. Well, right. Um, yes and no. And understand that man is made in the image of God. The Bible says God made... Uh, he created them male and female. Man was made in the image of God. Man was made to be in God's image, to be like him. And so when the enemy came to her and said, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, he was saying, you're going to be like God by eating this fruit of the tree. So she thought that in eating the tree, it was going to make her to be like God because they were created in the image of God. And so what he did was that he did plant something in her that did arouse her desire. And she actually was deceived in the believing that she was doing the thing that was going to make her like God when in fact it was going to destroy her. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so uh, yes, he did plant an element there, uh, but he played on her desires because she thought she was doing what she should do, even though it, wasn't, it was what she was not supposed to do because he convinced her, and as she reasoned in her mind, she saw that the tree was good for food. You know, he tricked her, you see. You understand? All right, yes. Exactly. Exactly. That's why he say he tricked himself out of heaven. Yep. And he does it all the time. Yes, ma'am. That's him. That's him. And so then you began to desire that. That was the lust that was in you. Lust, lust is desires. That's what lust is. A lot of times when you look in the scripture and you see where it says lust, you can understand it a little bit if you substitute the word lust for desires. Because that's what it is. Lust is, is desires. All right. And that is what caused her to have a fallen nature, you know. Yes? Yes. Because the Bible says that God said, now the man has become as one of us, and lest he take of the tree of life and live forever. So he kicked him out of the garden because God did not want him to live forever in the state of sin that he was in. Because the wages of sin is not eternal life. The wages of sin is what? Death.
Adam died saved because the Bible says he was the figure of him that which was to come. And who's that figure that which was to come? Jesus. And so if Adam was to die and go to hell, that wouldn't look pretty good for Jesus, would it? <laughs> you know. So yeah, so he will, he, 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 uh, he was forgiven, but the penalty still remain. All right, very good questions. Anybody else? We'll close. All right. Oh, yes. That is true. That's why the Bible says that the ministers are not ignorant of Satan's devices. And that's why we have the word of God to show us God has given us in his word how the enemy operates, how he works. And he lets us know how he works based on his word so that we would know how to deal with him. Just like a boxer has to know his opponent's footwork and speed and others so that and he has to watch him so he can learn how to defeat him and the same thing with us that's why we have the word of God and we have these things on record so that we can identify when these things come to us oh that's the devil that's wrong that's having your senses exercised that's you exercising your spiritual senses to discern good and evil. But you got to have this to do it. And you got to be taught it. Can we say amen? Yes, Elder Johnson? <laughs> the script about speaking life and life and death is in the power of the tongue. Well, um, first, that's in the book of James, right? Well, um, he was dealing with death in that text. He was dealing with assassinating somebody's character. That's the death he's dealing with. You can't kill nobody by your, just your words, but you can kill their influence. Giving the life to them is as the scripture says, exhort one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Encouraging each other, uplifting each other, giving each other the word of God, inspiring each other. There's only one life giver. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am what? The life. So they misinterpreted that scripture. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Um, is in the text that you can build up your brother and inspire them or you can kill them and tear them down through the power of the tongue. That's what he's talking about. So, any answer that? Anybody else? All right. Well, let's bless our offering and then we're going to be dismissed. God bless.